for me it's more about let's just reunite all those ingredients that I know when they're all there the magic happens I can't tell you exactly what's going to come out of it but geez, if you put effort and intention and ice cave and low light and ice ri and all that stuff together surely something decent will come out of it you don't know until you click it what the shot's going to be really when you put the experience ahead of everything else you win every time. You never come home disappointed. When you start seeing images as a nice byproduct of that experience, then I think that that's what really makes for an approach that's sustainable in photography and that's gonna keep you going as an artist. People will notice if you're bold enough to go out there and say, look guys, this is what I like, this is what appeals to me, this is what I like to create. If you like it, great. If you don't, it doesn't matter. Just have that confidence. And that's something I really admire in other photographers. Photographers who are not afraid to show their view of the world. Be a kid again. I think that so much of the fun in photography lies in curiosity. My name is Paul Ziska. I live in Banff National Park, right in the town of Banff, in the heart of the Canadian Rockies. And I've lived in Banff for over 12 years now. There's nowhere else I'd rather be. We're at Lake Minnewanka today here in Banff National Park and this is a big event for me. This is the annual crossing of Lake Minnewanka which is the longest, biggest lake in Banff National Park. It's about 25 kilometers long uh, and uh, the road is at one end and full-on backcountry at the other end. So you basically go in 25k well into the backcountry with just skates which is pretty cool and then you have to come back typically against the wind so it's a bit of an adventure i'm here with a bunch of friends today we're gonna aim to go all the way to the far end and hopefully capture a few special images along the way among that group of people that i'm with today are three world-class figure skaters that can do all sorts of tricks i'm really excited to uh, combine their talent with the landscape I don't really have anything specific in mind in terms of photography. Um, I'm just going to see what speaks to me as I go and uh, keep an eye out for anything that's unusual, anything that's, um, that's very, uh, that I've never seen before in terms of conditions at Lake Minnewanka. But a lot of the day is about having fun, catching up with friends in one of the most beautiful uh, ice rinks on the planet. The methane bubbles are a really, really fascinating phenomenon that we get uh, here in the Rockies on a few select lakes. And what they are is, is they, they're created when organic matter at the bottom of the lake decays and then the methane just bubbles up to the surface, gets trapped in ice, leading to that really, really interesting sort of 3D effect that makes for fantastic photo foregrounds. So people have come from all over the world to shoot those bubbles because of course when you combine them with the skylines that we have, um, you can get images that are just really, really spectacular. You can get complacent on lakes, even in the dead of winter. I think it's important to just carry all the necessary safety gear. We, uh, we always have uh, means of communication with us, even when we, go, when we skate well into the backcountry. We always have ice screws in order to measure the thickness of the lakes. We have rope. That makes for, in a way, a more peaceful experience because, you know, if, if something should happen, you have the knowledge and, uh, and the equipment to get you or your friends out of that situation. Here we are at Devil's Gap, just at nightfall. Um, we found some beautiful methane bubbles. Not a whole lot of them, but beautiful with uh, the shallow water underneath, especially when you cast a little bit of light and you bring out those, those greens that we see in the summer. That silt is still in suspension and so reflects the greens back to our eye and that makes, to, uh, that makes the bubbles give us that really cool 3D effect. 
Uh, it's a little getting a little chilly. The the wind factor is something to consider now. So uh, don't think we'll stop here for too long. We're gonna start uh, start going back and picking away at those, those 25 kilometers we have to cover still. I was able to go home with one image from the day, which is, you know, not um, typically what you hope for from a whole day of photography, but it's an image that I really, really like. And it's, uh, I think it conveys that really special moment uh, quite well that we had at the tail end of the day. So we're at our second location, a place called Marble Canyon in Kootenai National Park. It's an absolutely beautiful place. Um, very much underrated, in my opinion. Very cold temperatures um, sort of uh, taking over the Rockies over the last few days, and it doesn't seem to be budging, this big weather system. And so we've, uh, we've been in 30, minus 30, minus 40 temperatures for quite a few days now. I've got a couple ideas I'd like to work with this evening. I was here a few days ago, and I've been here multiple times in the summer, in the daytime, and so I know there's a lot of photo potential, but I've actually never shot here at night in the winter. So I'm really excited to finally be here in prime conditions. Beautiful night. It's just incredible how wildly different places look at night. You never believe it's the same place. One of the things I love the most about Marble Canyon is all year round, even in those minus 35, minus 30 temperatures, you get this, uh, because the water flows fast enough, you get the beautiful emerald color of the water showing all through the year. And that's the main, um, the main sort of attraction during the day. At night, it's kind of largely lost because of course it's so dark. We have a moonless night now and so I'm going to try to see if uh, I can bring back that beautiful emerald color by uh, dropping a light to the bottom of the canyon. So I got a 70 meter, meter rope and I'm going to attach a light to the end of the rope and I'm going to see if I can uh, sort of get it to glow from within and hopefully reveal that emerald color. Yeah, that'll be enough rope for sure. Tie a little light at the end here. As a night photographer, I rely on external sources of light considerably. And I love to have control over those sources of light. That makes my job a lot easier in the field. So I love to be able to change the amount of power that comes out of them, uh, the color. Uh, I love to be able to put them anywhere, so I need them to be durable. So I love those loom cubes because, um, yeah, they're very, very adjustable in so many ways. They're durable. Um, I can put them in the water. I love playing around with um, low light, water, ice. Uh, I love just the wide array of effects that you can create when you play around with those ingredients. Warm the hands a bit and then we'll drop a light to this canyon, see if we can light it from within. A tough night for the rope. Mix of white and yellow light, we'll see what happens. It's definitely one of those nights where everything's a bit more of a hassle and the gear starts to... the risk of the gear failing on you is greater for sure. So we'll drop this light in, see what happens. The difference between holding the light above the water and dropping it inside, the way the light propagates, the difference is just incredible. So right now I'm trying to get a feel for, well, what's in front of me because it's so incredibly dark. I have to rely on technology, I have to rely on the power of the camera to reveal what's in front of me that I can work with in order to compose something. So I'm taking some really uh, high ISO test shots that will give me an idea of what the composition is like and then I will um, 
I will sort of nudge the composition a little bit and, until I'm totally happy with it and I'll bring back the ISO to a, a usable value when I actually start shooting. But for now I find it's a huge time saver in the field to, um, to push that ISO really, really high so I can quickly see what I have to work with because my human eyes are too limited to see what's available. So I just need to nudge the composition. I just need to move my whole setup to the right. When it comes to compositions, I can just move things around for half an hour until I'm happy with where things are at. Oh yeah, <laughs> look at that. Look at the test shot, beautiful. The light from within makes the shot and just from this, even though the light's not in the water, I can tell I'm starting to bring back that green. And I just love the glow from within. It gives me back that balance that I need because the upper half of the shot is so uh, full of interest with that perfectly triangular mountain, the stars, but the bottom half needs to be able to compete with that. I love where this is going now. Um, it's a matter of tweaking things until everything is just right. Oh, I got a glimpse of what it's gonna look like if I keep the light source above the surface of the water and I'm gonna drop the light uh, under the surface into the into the creek itself just to see uh, the difference in color and the difference in light on those pillows and uh, I might as well try both and then start building on the idea on the look that I like best. I need more light. My process, especially at night, is always to basically start off with a test shot that I fully expect will look pretty horrible and then to fix things one at a time until ideally 20, 30 shots later, I have one image that has it all, where everything aligns, where the composition is strong, the light is good. I always expect it's gonna be a process. It's always, um, it's always a, fair, a fair amount of time being committed to any single shot at night. Yeah, once you drop that light in the water, um, that changes everything. And I think for me, um, I find at night, you don't know until you try things out. So much of nighttime is about experimenting for me and I love what I'm seeing there. So what I'm gonna do next is just bring down the ISO to uh, a value that will give me usable images and I'll start shooting for real because I think all my elements are in place. The next thing I'll need to perhaps tweak is the amount of light at the bottom. Um, but otherwise I feel like I'm really, really close to something that uh, matches the initial vision. Those glaciers that come down from the Great Divide are very prone to wind uh, and so it was not really surprising that day when we experienced some pretty strong gusts trying to get up to the Saskatchewan Glacier. I want to say up to 100 kilometers per hour um, so even, even in a place that's known to be windy uh, that day was off the charts uh, from my experience. I've been to the Saskatchewan maybe 10-15 times over the course of my life and that was the windiest day that I've had out there. And with the drifting snow, uh, though it, it led to really interesting conditions, really interesting, um, fascinating light. So that was some of the best light I've experienced all winter, thanks to um, being willing to put up with a little bit of wind. It, it was really special, made you feel alive that day for sure, getting into the Saskatchewan. The idea with going to that ice cave that day was essentially to extend the wild skating season because all of the local lakes uh, had been snow covered. But thankfully there was an ice cave um, that sort of harbored, that hosted a really cool indoor ice rink. For now, the priority is to get organized as quickly as possible because we only have about an hour of daylight to work with. Um, and then for those, uh, I'd like to get some dynamic shots, shots of people in motion. And uh, for that, I need some daylight. So um, time's of the essence a little bit. So I think what we're gonna do first is try to improve the quality of the ice. 
Uh, we've got shovel at our, uh, broom at our disposal. We got shovel, and we're boiling some water as well to try to, you know, resurface it a little bit so it's a bit more reflective. And uh, then my plan is to get the guys in the shot, passing the puck, and hopefully get a couple action shots um, while we still have that natural blue um, coming through the walls here. this little broom is to get the ice as reflective as possible and it's a great way to warm up. Oh man, this broom works really well, so check it out. Check out the broom. Like takes a few. Oh, oh no, not the broom. Oops. Like, look from here low. If we get this bit pure, really reflective, look at this. It works. Oh man, it works! It works! It works. <laughs> ah! Totally works, okay? Oh, oh. it's totally like a Zen Okay, here I come. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. I just love getting out with fellow photographers in the field and even using them as the models in the photos because they understand what it means to me to be able to shoot that photo and of course I would gladly do the same for them. We kind of get each other that way and that's really, really crucial. keeps you excited years into it that's what keeps you going along your journey as a photographer is to experiment and really play around with new ideas and so I'd shot ice caves before but I'd never shot skating in an ice cave which for me was um, you know a new fresh direction to take and so that's definitely what I wanted to explore You know, one of our main concerns before having kids was the worry that we would have to sacrifice some of our passions entirely. There is a way to make it work and, and fit, keep adventure into your life and introduce your kids to adventure. I can't say that we perform it perfectly every day. There's the odd ball that gets dropped for sure, but I think overall we do pretty well. And I think one of the keys to that is really blocking off time. If a day is about family, then it doesn't matter how good the light gets. It's a day about family and if the sunrise is uh, un, you know, unbelievable, we'll just enjoy it as it is, not through the camera. It's, it's a little bit of a, a juggling act, but I think if you're able to stay flexible, then it's an incredible experience to be able to bring in your family into the mix and get them to understand how special it is to live here in the Rockies.